The incident of the USS Liberty has been an issue of debate and conspiracy theory. We're speaking with an expert on the subject, Danny Grossman, who uh, collaborated in a book entitled... Well, I helped uh, an author named Jay Crystal, who's a federal judge from uh, Florida, who investigated it in an extremely uh, methodical, historical way, and also based on his background as both a, an aviator for the U.S. Navy and as a judge advocate general in the uh, Navy, and of course as a person who wanted to get to the bottom of the truth. Uh, my first experience with the Liberty was, uh, I believe, 86, 87, uh, right after I'd shown the United States Vice President at the time, George Bush, around Israel. And I was asked by the commander of the Air Force and by the IDF spokesman uh, to see if I could also escort a British film crew from Thames Television, which wanted to do a, a film, a full-length uh, film about the Liberty. And because, unbeknownst to me at the time, it was some 20 years after the incident, it was one of the great conspiracy theories at the time. Today, fast forward almost 30 years later, it still remains one of the great conspiracy theories, and justifiably so because both uh, Israel, which actually came clean, if you will, and published reports immediately after the incident, had a, uh, an investigative report uh, which was uh, headed by a committee which was uh, under, the, uh, under the Judge Advocate General of the Israeli Army at the time. Uh, uh, and uh, even though Israel had, had done an accident investigation into it, uh, the United States had never released this to the people. And uh, what I found as the bottom line of the whole story is that uh, those people, the, uh, the men and the families of those people who uh, were injured or were killed, uh, were never really told the entire story, which is tragic because uh, when you send a loved one into combat and, and who's killed, and that person, uh, you want to know what happened. And if it was done through uh, fire from an enemy, then that's something you can live with. If it's done from what we call friendly fire or inadvertent fire uh, from one side to another, uh, then you want a full explanation. And not only that, you will not rest. And this is something we've learned in the Israeli army as well. Israel has had very several incidents uh, Ehud Barak, who was our Prime Minister at the time, uh, was the uh, commander of the IDF, uh, was involved in several incidents in the IDF where uh, innocent Israeli soldiers were killed in an exercise, and the families to this day won't accept until they know all the story. So similarly here too, unless you see someone accept full responsibility, and then someone who made a mistake which caused the death uh, the unfortunate death of people who are uh, innocent, uh, you want to know what happened. And so it lends itself to a conspiracy, especially because the whole story never came out. So Israel, uh, there's actually a commission, uh, not only an Israeli commission, but later by former Senator Adlai Stevenson looked into it, had a impaneled a, uh, an investigation into it. Uh, but even then, the whole story from both sides, from both the Israeli side and the American side, uh, was never really came to light, and especially to the victims uh, of that uh, tragic accident. And it was a, it was a tragedy of uh, of the fog of war, if you will. Is that the explanation? Well, the the explanation is if you want to know, you have to know the whole story, step by step. And something I've learned, having flown fighters for nearly thirty years, is that whenever there is a mishap, an accident. Uh, a tragic, something which has tragic results, it's almost never the result of just one mistake. It's usually a long series of mistakes by more than one person, by several people, and if you were to just break the chain of mistakes at some point, you could have avoided and the, uh, the end result. Uh, in this case, it wasn't. So if the whole story actually begins, if you go back to the very beginning of the story, the United States sent the Liberty, which was not under the aegis of the Sixth Fleet. The, EG was, the, the Liberty was a, uh, a refurbished uh, intelligence gathering ship 
uh, in which the people on the ship, uh, there were of course naval personnel manning the ship, but the people in the ship were from the NSA. And you know, the joke goes, NSA, you know what it stands for, of course, no such agency. Meaning, obviously it's the National Security Agency, but it's an agency which is extremely secretive about what it's doing. And they got their orders to basically set up a listening to listen in on the communications, mostly about the Egyptians. That was uh, what they were interested in finding out. Again, one of the real things that happens in conspiracy theories is you'll normally want to say, what was the reason for the people who did what they did? So some people would say, well, uh, it's because Israel wanted to avoid the Americans spying on them. The Liberty didn't even have Hebrew linguists on board. Okay, there were people who understood, you know, uh, Egyptian, and their their orders were to take yeah, were to take up a listening position off the coast of El Arish, and uh, they were given their orders, and they set out from Rota, Spain, on the Saturday before the Six Day War broke out. Even okay, and now it's hard to understand today when you have the internet and you have communications and you have uh, state of the art what it is in in 20, uh, 2018, uh, if you go back 50 years, which is when the liberty happened, uh, remember the United States was fighting a war in Vietnam at the time. So when the war broke out, okay, and the captain of the liberty, who was a very brave man, a one, an amazing person, uh, set sail for the Medi for Eastern Mediterranean, uh, his last orders were to set up a a, uh, an orbit, if you will, uh, some within line of sight of the coast, which is about 13, 14 nautical miles. And uh, yet, when the war finally did break out, so several emergency messages were sent to the Liberty, okay, uh, telling it not to come within 100 miles, which would have made sense. Had those messages reached the Liberty in time, there never would, be, would have been an incident, obviously. There are many, many mistakes on both sides. So, number one, the ship itself never got the orders to stay away from the coast. When it finally did arrive, and it arrived on the fourth day of the war, and took up its position, listening, uh, this is after Israel had successfully, uh, in Operation Mokade, where Israel bombed 11 Egyptian airfields in the first three hours of the war, and then later, turns its attention to Jordan and to Syria, uh, and of course the Israeli troops were already on their way to the Suez Canal uh, at the time, uh, but what happened was the Liberty finally reaches, uh, takes up its position, and now virtually every Israeli aircraft, which was on its way to Egypt at the time, and they were still doing bombing missions against Egypt, was reporting this big ship, which they saw. And in fact, there was a Nord, Nord Atlas. Remember, at the time of the Six-Day War, Israel uh, was flying mostly French aircraft. The fighters were the Mystere, Super Mystere. The Mirage was the number one fighter, which we had at the time. The helicopters were the Alouette or the Super Furlon. And the Nord Atlas was the transport. So there was a Nord, uh, which actually buzzed the ship early in the morning, which had a naval observer on board. And he came back some six o'clock in the morning, having flown very low, and the people on the Liberty reported it. They saw that they were being observed. He flew almost over the, uh, the antenna. And uh, the ship, after they landed, they took out Jane's All the World's Fighting Ship and said, oh, this is a US intelligence gathering ship. They had identified the ship 6 a.m. Had that information been handled properly, again, no incident, nothing would have happened. What happened was, uh, that's now we're starting to begin a series of mistakes, okay? Uh, the people who reported it at the time uh, reported to the Navy headquarters. And remember, the Navy in 1967, their headquarters was not co located with the Israeli command posts of the Army and the Air Force, which are both in Tel Aviv. The Navy was up in Stella Maris near Haifa, okay? So again, 60 miles away, but still a very long way, not in a distance where you can go and talk to people. They're speaking by phone, okay? And this is also important in unraveling what actually happened, these phone conversations. So they had marked the ship, and remember, this is not with computers. 
this is if you remember watching World War II movies, when uh, if you plot a ship, you actually have a big plot board where you know uh, a young female soldier will put a will put a big plot of a of a ship with a little white mask on it and showing that that's a neutral ship. So the ship was marked properly at 6 a.m. Well, what happens? The Navy has I remember the remember also the mindset of the Israeli Navy in 1967. The Air Force did most of the work in the first several hours, the first days of the war. The Navy, besides two ships running into each other, did very, very little. Okay? So, when the Naval Command Post marked the ship uh, at 11 a.m., there was a change of the guard in the Naval Command Center. And the new commander comes in and he says, okay, when is this information from? And they said, well, it's five hours old. And it showed the ship incorrectly marked as going to the west and so it said oh it's probably not there anymore take it off the board the minute that ship was taken off the board for no good reason other than the commander saying probably not there anymore and we'll get to the, him later because he's the only one who was reprimanded in this whole story for having removed this this information uh, uh, and by the way he's, he, he was never promoted after that etc but he's the only one that's that's basically a slap on the wrist and 34 people were killed and hundreds were wounded so it was a horrible tragedy a horrible mistake but again no the the americans never saw anybody's head swinging from the yard arm so once the ship was at the at, was taken off the board about an hour later at el arish where the israelis had conquered el arish the day or two prior and now a munitions dump started going up in El Arish. The people in Southern Command saying, what's going on here? They said, they look out, they see, up. Oh, there's a ship off. They see a ship far away. We must be being bombarded. Okay, now it doesn't make sense if you think about it, but anybody who's ever been in combat knows that you make splits, splits decisions and not always correct ones. So at the time, they said, okay, Launched the fleet, send out, and the Navy sent out two torpedo boats, which, if you ever watch things like uh, uh, the uh, the PT-109 with JFK or uh, McHale's Navy, these are the type of ships which were sent out with little torpedoes on them. Okay, and they were sent out. A uh, squadron of three ships was sent out from Ashdod, and now they and they're bouncing along the waves, and they have a radar which is state of the art at the time. There's huge big radar screen and they plotted it not with a computer but with big plotters and they said oh my god they mistakenly plotted it they said the ship is going 25 30 knots to the west okay but the liberty going downhill with a tailwind couldn't go 30 knots okay but leave it as it may they said we're not to catch the ship can you help us with anyone else the air force had a two-ship of Mirage aircraft. The Mirage was a, an air-to-air -air machine, basically. That's the way Israel used it. It did do bombing missions. Okay, but these were on an air-to-air -air mission on a patrol looking for MiGs near the canal. So the Naval Commander and the Naval Command Center calls the Air Force Command Center and says, can you give us a couple of airplanes? No problem. They, send the, they have enough fuel, they go over there. And here's where if you will, just understand the history of it. Luck was on, on the side of history because the, the pilots who were sent over to attack the Liberty or to identify the Liberty were said, look, here's the story. There's an unidentified ship out there. Okay, we believe it's Egyptian. We also have a three-ship formation of our ships which are, which are trying to close in on it, but they say they can't reach it. We want you to, to identify it and here are their marching orders. Identify the ship. If it's a warship, and if it's not one of ours, you can attack. Now remember at the time, Israeli Air Force, you know, Mirage airplanes, had very, very little experience in bombing ships. So the, the captain of the two ship uh, comes down at low altitude, okay, very high airspeed, because again, if you think it's and they, if you could say, and, and perhaps in an enemy ship, you're going to maintain your 400, 500 knots, which is very fast. Okay? And he's looking for a flag. He's looking for a flag. 
And this is also a very emotional issue, whether the fleet, the ship had a flag, didn't have a flag. You know, people make a big deal out of it. It's a moot point, basically, because what was he looking for? He's looking for a flag, which is what you would think a flag is, you know, with a, a, a mask with a flag. Now, actually, the way the, the, the Liberty was flying its flags was like, think of it as a, as a clothesline with the flags down. But leave that as it may, because in his first pass, he didn't see it. He didn't see him. He didn't see it. So he comes in. Okay. He's not one of ours. He's he definitely looks like a warship. And by the Liberty was painted gray like a warship, but it was a big bucket and it didn't have guns. It had a few forward mounted machine guns. That's it. But to a fighter pilot who's told if it's a warship, you can get hit it. So now he's going to roll in and hit it. So he reached now, whether it had a mass, had a flag or didn't have a flag is a moot point for sure after his first pass. Because what did the Mirage have? He didn't have air to ground munitions. He had a 30 millimeter cannon. Now remember the Mirage, air, Mirage airplane with a 30 millimeter cannon is a very potent weapon against tanks or against other aircraft, not so much against a ship. He also had even an air to air missile, which it even crossed his mind, and I debriefed the pilot, maybe he should shoot the air to air missile, which of course would have done nothing to it. You know, it was a heat seeking missile. But basically he comes in, in his first pass, he lights up a whaleboat under the bridge, okay, which has kerosene and now there's black smoke pouring out of it. So you even hear the pilot, and this is the, the where history gave to understand, to debrief, he gave a helping hand because the pilot, when he was requested to go and identify the ship, even asked, should I stay on the air to air freak, the air to air frequency? Or should I transfer over to the air-to-ground frequency? And they said, no, you're, you're flying air to stay in that frequency. The ground control didn't monitor every frequency or didn't record every frequency, but they recorded the air-to-air -air because that's where all the action was, okay? So, they, so we stayed on that. So that's why we have actually a recording of the pilot's voice. We can't hear both the pilot and the controller because it's line of sight. So all we hear is the airplane, which is above the horizon. And you're clearly asking, clearly talking about, you know, he sees, he sees the Israeli ships, he sees the Liberty, and, and he goes in and he starts strafing the ship. And, and the ship even starts, you see, from the first pass, he lights up the bridge. The pilot even says, the ship is, is putting out smoke like a smoke screen. You know, which is again, with you're interpreting things as you see them. Later, under the fluorescent lights, it doesn't make any sense. Not, a ship isn't going to put out smoke to camouflage itself. But again, thinking about it at the time, that's, that's, that was the pilot's first reaction. So he makes several passes, okay, coming down from the nose of the ship pretty much. And uh, it's a two ship. And then he comes off. And now, in the meantime, the controller on the ground, the Israeli Air Force controller, is a very sharp guy. And remember I mentioned there were phone conversations between Stella Maris, the Navy headquarters, and the Air Force headquarters. So what we have is we have the pilot, we have the pilot speaking, we have a recording of the pilot's communications, we also have a recording of the telephone communications. So you hear the Navy guy talking to the Air Force guy and the command center, you hear the command center the conversations between the the uh, ground controllers, and which kind of dovetail into what they're hearing from the pilots. And now you hear they send in a second formation of super mysteries. Now these airplanes, what do they have on them? They have air to ground munitions. What munitions? Napalm. Now napalm is very scary to me and you because what is napalm? You know, it's it's liquefied jelly. You know. Yeah, yeah and makes fire for a ship if you have from zero to a hundred of your weapons of choice it's zero as opposed to 100 because you know, you know what does napalm do to a ship nothing i think you even hear the controller saying what does he have he has napalm what does napalm do to a ship so they drop their napalm but the bombs don't even hit the ship they hit right and they miss if you miss by one inch you've missed the whole thing completely 
so they don't have iron bombs. In the meantime, you hear the controller, who's a sharp guy, he says, you know what? He will scramble a four ship from Tel Nof, which is you know uh, one of the main bases, uh, with iron bombs. Now, iron bombs, if that four ship makes it to the Liberty, they're going to sink the Liberty. Okay, there's no doubt about it. So four ship iron bombs. Okay, we'll leave those. We'll leave those guys just about taking off from from Tel Aviv. Okay, here's what happens with the second formation. The second formation of Super Mysterious. After they after they drop their napalm, now they come in and they're strafing. Halfway through the second strafing round, the pilot who really saves the Liberty. It's a guy who says, wait a minute, this is weird. I've been dropping napalm, I've been strafing the ship, okay, and, oh, by the way, before he gets to this, he actually even says, he sees the Navy boats finally approaching, and he uses the word, he says, you know what, send me a four ship with real bombs, and he uses the word, it'll be a mitzvah. Meaning, what is he saying? It'll be a mitzvah. A good deed. It'll be a good deed that the Air Force will sink the ship by itself. And God forbid the Navy should have any part of the glory. By the way, the naval ship, the Navy guys are hearing the Air Force guys. And you know what they're saying to themselves? They say the words, Ibram al-Awal. What is Ibram al-Awal? Which is Arabic for? No, it's the name of an Egyptian ship, which in 1956, in the 56 war, Taxied into the Haifa, taxis into the into the Haifa Bay, and started attacking Haifa. And the Israeli Navy at the time, which remember the Israeli Navy was not so great in those days, was not even able to fight the ships away from attacking Haifa in '56, and it was a big uh, embarrassment for the Navy at the time because in '56. The, uh, the forces which actually stopped the Ibrahim al-Awal was, again, an Air Force formation of fighters, which disabled the ship, which was then towed back in and actually became part of the Israeli Navy. So that was in the naval commander's uh, mindset was the Air Force is out to screw us again. They want to get the glory. They, want it. They, don't want, they don't want us to be part of the action. They're going to have it. So now... After the pilot has said it'll be a mitzvah to hit the ship with real bombs, now he goes down and he says, this is weird. I'm bombing, I'm, I've bombed the ship. Uh, it didn't do any effect with the napalm, obviously. I've strafed it, and they're not shooting back. This isn't war that I understand. So now, he slows up, you know, they're very slow, 250 to 300 knots, very slow airspeed, and he's flying right along the wave tops along the no, uh, to start reading the letters on the nose of the ship. Now, if it's an Egyptian ship, it's going to have Egyptian marking. What does he see? And you hear a very dramatic voice. He says, listen up. And he repeats himself, listen up. I'm reading the letters on the nose of the ship. And it's CTR... Charlie Tango Romeo 5. By the way, the, it wasn't Charlie. It was actually golf. It was golf Tango Romeo 5. Okay. But, it, but, you know, that's also, you can't make this up. It's obviously, he's, so he makes a slight mistake, but, he's, but he, he's reading what he sees. Okay. So he says, that's not any kind of ship. That's not an Egyptian ship. Oh. And, now the, and now the Air Force controller takes his microphone, throws it against the, his, his dashboard, if you will, and he says... The Navy fucked me again. He says, because he says, the Navy was, was telling us this is an a, Egyptian ship. And now the guy who's there is saying, no, it's really an American ship. So he says, that's it. So now, had he stopped then, it's like the song, Dayenu, it would have been enough. Right. So many of the people were killed, including, by the way, the commander, McGonagall, who was injured in the first strafing pass, but never left the bridge. Very, he got the Medal of Honor. Very brave guy. And, uh, and yet... And yet, the ship was pretty much still intact. But now what happens, the Navy start, they taxi in closer to take a look. Okay, after the Air Force has already called off the attack, 
the Navy is told the Air Force is just after, has, has been bombing it and strafing it, and now they say it's mistaken identity. The Navy guys are now finally reaching up close enough to the ship. They're taxiing with three torpedo boats, point blank range. And now what happens? There are no real communications on the ship because they've been, remember this, the, the bridge has been attacked. And now the guys in the forward gun mast, okay, said, hey, I have had enough of this crap. They take the machine guns and they start shooting at the Navy boats who are finally arriving. And the Navy boats call back to the headquarters, which is, remember, in Stella Maris, not even co-located uh, with the Air Force. And they say, hey, guys, our naval ships are under attack from this boat. And the guy in the naval boat, if you think of his mindset, he says, hey, the guy's back in the headquarters telling me it's a mistake. I'm being shot at. You're back there all nice and warm and dry. I'm here bouncing around in the waves being shot at. And he requests permission to put in a torpedo, okay, to use to launch the torpedoes. Now, three torpedo ships all launch their torpedoes at point blank range at a non-maneuvering target with the state of the art of the Israeli Navy at the time. And of course, today we're talking about one of the most advanced navies in the world. But then they all launch torpedoes, only one of them hits. That one torpedo was enough to do most most of the people who were killed would kill that. And also, had it not been for the bravery of the captain who actually sealed several of the compartments at the time, that's what saved the ship from sinking at the time. And they were later, by the, they were later able to tow the ship into port. So the Navy finally taxis in a little bit closer and they start seeing American soldiers on the ship who've had enough of this, they pick up a flag and they're waving it. And they call out and the Navy guys say, oh my God, it's an American flag. And now they finally, for the second and last time, they call off the attack. One little curious thing, which is also important because of the communications, was remember I said the commander, the ground commander at first, uh, when he first thought that you needed airplanes with real bombs, sends out a four ship from Tel Nof with iron bombs. But then when he hears, ah, it's really not that, what does he do? He says he, he, he calls that attack off. He sends those, that force ship off to attack another target. And at the same time, he launches a super furlon, also from Tel Nof. That's a big helicopter. Actually, it's, even, it's a French helicopter. It can even land on the water. It goes out there. And it super furlon goes out there. So, go out to this ship, there may be a mistaken attack, okay, and um, pick up whatever survivors you can see. So now the Super Fulon's on in its way, but remember the Navy, at that, during that, in that interim time, then changed its mind, got close and said, hmm, they're shooting at us, maybe it is a, 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 a Navy, a, an Egyptian ship. So now they say, oh my God, it's Egyptian, we were putting in torpedoes. The helicopter pilot calls back and says, well, what should I do now? The Navy just changed his mindset. It really is maybe an Egyptian ship. Right. So the, the Air Force uh, control in Tel Aviv says, oh, you know what? Pull back. Don't go in. Wait until the Navy finishes its work. And then when the Navy finally did finish its work and then realized it was a mistake and saw the flag for sure, yes. so now the controller... In Tel Aviv, tells the helicopter pilot who's out there, he says, you know what? It really was a mistake. Okay, it's really a neutral vessel. Okay, pick up whoever is out there. Now, put yourself in the shoes of the helicopter pilot. First, you're told you're going after a mistaken attack. Then you see you're told, oh, it really is Egyptian. Now you're told, oh, really really was a mistaken attack. He's confused. He radios back, and, uh, and, and this transition is important, I'll get to it, why? He radios back, look, I'm confused already. I really don't know. First you tell me it's friendly, then you tell me it's not friendly, now you tell me it's friendly again. This is before the Air Force had an Air Force Special Operations Unit. It was just basically a pilot, co-pilot, 
and a, uh, a flight mechanic. He says, if it really is a, an Egyptian ship and you want me to pick up survivors, okay, they're not going to be very happy with us, are they? Okay, so I have, no, I have nothing to defend myself. I'm supposed to pick up Egyptian soldiers in my ship, in my, in my helicopter. How am I going to defend? How am I going to protect myself? Yeah. The controller actually uses the words. He says, you know what? I'm confused to myself already. He says, here's what you do. Fish them out of the water. And by the way, there were no people. They didn't take anybody out of the water. But he says, fish them out of the water. Talk to them. Listen to the language they're speaking. If it's English, bring them back to the shore. He says, if it's Arabic, give them a clup on the head, throw them back in the water. Horrible. Sounds horrible. But even a Hollywood screenwriter can come up with this stuff. So, you know, and now how do we know about these conversations? Well, we have them in our recordings. As it turns out... When you say in our recordings, meaning... The, the Israeli, in the, in the Israeli command recordings. Okay. And, and Be, because, the, because where do you live? Well, no. I am, at the time, a major in the Israeli Air Force. You were? At the time, yeah. I, I retired. 67. No, no, no. In, uh, when, I'm, when, I'm, uh -oh. when I'm researching when, this. When you researched it. And when I'm researching it, because the first thing I did, I'm a product. I was born and raised in America. And probably, You're an American yeah, by, 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 by birth. Yeah. And by, by culture and everything. By culture. Well, I was in Israel. I've lived in Israel since 79. So, but I remember very vividly the Watergate tapes of, uh, you know, 19, the Rosemary Woods and the uh -huh, uh -huh. So I said, look, you can talk to a pilot and he can lie to you as he smiles at you. It doesn't matter. And you, and, or your memory can play tricks on you. But tapes are tapes. That's real, pure history. So, with that being my mindset, I spent three days in the archives of the IDF, listening to channel after channel. They didn't have all the channels. Obviously, it's a big war. But they had the channel of the air-to-air. -air. So I heard the pilot who led the attack. And I also heard, on a separate frequency, the helicopter pilot. And I listened to the, also the ground controllers, uh, which was on a separate frequency. That was the tapes of, the, uh, of, of their recordings. And each one, by the each of the recordings had what we call a talking clock. You know, after every 30 seconds, they would say, the time is now 1327. The time is now 1327. Now the time is now 1327. So you can actually compare and build the picture very, very easily. As it turns out, the, the United States, the United States Navy, by the way, at the time, they scrambled fighters from, uh, I, don't, I don't remember if it was the Nimitz, but they, they scrambled fighters. Uh, and there was even talk that at first the fighters they were going to scramble were nuclear armed for air to ground or whatever, and they had to change it. All that is a, is a moot point. It doesn't matter. It's written in other, other books, but it really doesn't matter because those fighters never became part of the picture anyway. Um, because like I guess originally the ship was an NSA ship. Okay, it wasn't like part of the Sixth Fleet, which was reporting to this and that. Uh, so now, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll talk about what happened on the on the ground as well, because that's also relevant to the story. So, can, we, can we take three steps backwards? Sure. Because we're out of the light. Okay. Maybe three more. No problem. Okay. Good. So now the tapes of the helicopter pilots. Not the tapes of the Mirage pilots or of the Super Mystere pilots, but the tape of the helicopter pilots talking, saying, I'm going out to a ship, may I have to go back, you know, I'm coming in. Uh, and they say, I'm flying over the ship, I want to see if I can pick people up from the ship. They don't want to be picked up. You, know, this, you hear all this conversation with him, but basically you hear the guy who's, who's, who's trying to understand you know, what's going on, and he does want to, want to help. All of his recordings were also recorded by an EC-121, which is a which is separate what? intelligence gathering platform. A U.S. plane. By, from the United States Air Force. Okay. okay, but their tapes dovetail as far as the time and the recordings of the same voices of the same helicopter pilot 
It's all the same. So it all fits perfectly. And how, how did you learn this? Well, I, I had read through the protocols of the original accident investigation. And of course, there are little mistakes here and there, you know, where people will say, you know, he'll say, I was at 3,000 feet. And then you'll look into his logbook and he, was, he said, well, I wrote I was at 5,000 feet, which doesn't matter, you know, really. It's, you know, the, but, but basically said, and I looked, in more, more important, I also looked at the gun camera film. You know, you have a, uh, a, a camera. Uh, and it's, was it publicly accessible, this information? I mean, uh, these, these materials? Most of the materials had been in the original uh, board of inquiry, which had been convened immediately after the attack. And there was a judge, Yerushalmi, who was a very distinguished judge who was actually investigated. And he took evidence from all the people. Okay. And like I say, later, Adley Stevenson came in. They had interviewed several of the pilots, whatever. So the story had been made accessible, of course, to the Israeli uh, board of inquiry, because Israel, this wasn't a shining moment in Israel's history. You know, it was a terrible mistake, a terrible tragedy. You know, innocent people are dead. And many more are wounded. Some 34 were dead, and hundreds, to over 200, I think 34 were, were wounded. That's it's a horrible tragedy. And um, Israel, so, so uh, basically you have, the NSA has these stories. None of the none of these debriefings or none of the uh, recordings were ever relayed or made public to the people. In fact, many of the people who were interviewed later who were survivors of liberty were land land later they were towed uh, they were towed to port and they were signed on papers never to talk about it whatever. So I can my heart goes out as someone who has been a combatant. And also who knows people who are families in Israel who've, who've lost their loved ones, but who have never been told the whole story. You're never going to rest until you know what the story is. And if someone made a mistake and is responsible, he should pay a price. And here, nobody ostensibly paid a price. The U.S. supposedly sent five um, emergency messages to the ship. At first, they were routed through, Viet through Southeast Asia. Or it was also a weekend in London, if you will, so Aflant. So the, actually the first messages which reached the ship not to go within 100 miles of the coast were a couple hours after the ship was attacked. Why the delay? What? Why the delay? Because that was the state that the, America was fighting its own war. It was in Southeast Asia. It wasn't really fighting a war in the Middle East at the time. These things happened. Stupid, dumb mistakes, but they happen. Anybody who knows the military, any military, knows that these things can happen. How can you make a mistake and miss and see this big bucket and think it's a warship? Again, if you're a fighter pilot with your fangs somewhere around your knees, you're going to make a mistake. Okay, had it not been for the flight lead of the super mystere who called off the attack and also told them to send the four ship with real hard bombs, which he had just asked for, so it would be a mitzvah, and he said, no, send them somewhere else, the, the liberty would have, been, would have been sunk. And all of this would have been a moot point. No one would be, there would be no one to talk to. Um, so where have these facts been published? Well, now, I'll never forget when, the, when I was first asked to help this British film crew from Thames Television, uh, it was very interesting. It was Thames Television, not the BBC. Why? Because Thames sent a film producer to tell the story, a very interesting story, of a conspiracy theory from 1967. It wasn't a reporter who's just looking to make a big headline and get a splash. If we're a, head, a guy looking just for a headline, so you tell the sexiest story, which is a conspiracy, how Israel attacked its best friend, America. That's a sexy story. But the guy was actually a filmmaker, if you will, interested in the truth. Documentarian. Yes. And, he, got him, uh, and he, he changed the story. He was going to interview. He had marvelous footage. He, was, he actually, you know, in Israel, we don't allow anybody to interview a pilot. That's very 
you know, for, for for many good reasons. But um, you mean someone outside the IAF? Yes, like a a uh, you have to have special permission, and, and then usually you don't show the guy's face. But here, they had even gotten the name and telephone number of the guys, and they were going to do an ambush of the pilot who led the mission and put a microphone in his face, you know, you know, today you're working at a major Israeli uh, industry and 20 years ago you were bombing American uh, things. Would have made great television. Okay? But it wasn't it wasn't the, the truth. The facts didn't support it. Yeah, the facts the, the facts were the, and when and I even when uh, I even had a very interesting uh an interesting uh, vignette when I, after I found after I found the uh, the tapes, I wanted to play them for the uh, film crew, which was trying to do its research, and they said, "Oh no, there are archive rules; you can't give it to them." So I said, so I asked the commander of the Air Force at the time, who was a guy who understands the the public media, and he and he said, "You know what? Play the guy the tapes." Don't give him the tapes because that would be against the law. But let him hear it. Let him hear it. So I said, look, I don't care. Bring me Yasser Arafat. Bring me anybody who speaks Hebrew, who understands it, who will explain it to you. I'm not going to pull any punches. You're going to listen to it. You'll make up your own mind. Okay, bring someone who really understands Hebrew and we'll just play it for you. So we played it for you. Very interesting story. And uh, he was convinced uh, and he changed in a heartbeat the story that he was telling from the how Israel screwed over its best friend and attacked its best friend to the tragedy of mistaken attacks in warfare. By the way, the story aired the same week of the attack on the Stark, if you remember that, was, which is also a very tragic uh, occurrence. And these things happen. They, they, and you're always going to have it, unfortunately. Uh, so, was this a shining moment in the in the history of the Israeli Air Force, the Israeli Navy? Obviously not. You know, innocent people were killed. It was a tragedy. And as anybody who's ever fought, there's a there's a um, camaraderie, a real empathy among people who have served their countries and who've given their all like the people on the Liberty did. And I have nothing but empathy for all the, the people who lost their lives, who have who lost limbs, who lost their loved ones. You know, terrible tragedy. And Israel apologized Israel, officially. And Israel apologized officially. Israel apologized officially immediately. Okay, by the way, interestingly, several people had their own takes of it. Dean Rusk, who is the Secretary of State, didn't, see, he, he said that, oh, well, Israel did it on purpose, but for political reasons, we can't go after them. Or even, there was General Keegan, who was the head of Air Force Intelligence, who was very, very uh, pro-Israel, if you will. Uh, he thought Israel was great. Look, we wiped out all the Israeli, all the Arab armies and air forces so quickly. How can we make such a colossal mistake? But if you analyze it, there's no reason for Israel to have attacked the liberty. And that's part of, that's where a conspiracy theory falls apart, because what's the motive? There was no motive. You could say, oh, Israel didn't want America prying into its business, but there, it doesn't make sense. So, so you, the commander of the, the naval commander at the time, the naval attache in Tel Aviv, was a guy named Ernie Castle, he said, so you don't want America to find out, so you're gonna bomb one of their ships? This doesn't make any sense. So that's where it, it kind of falls apart. Um, later, after this TV show came out, there was a, a U.S. federal judge. I mentioned a guy named Jay Crystal, who was a brilliant, brilliant guy. Uh, he was doing his master. He started by doing his masters for fun. You know, as a federal judge, he wanted to do something, you know, for his own interest. So he took it. He took at the University of Miami. He was doing a master's in history. Now, he also was a naval aviator when he was younger. So he flew off carriers. He knew about aviation. He actually studied the laws of war and worked as a JAG, as a judge advocate general. 
uh, in the uh, if anyone's ever seen the TV show JAG Corps, you know, so he, he knows all of naval warfare. He even taught at San Remo. He taught special courses about this, so he really understands the, the laws of war. And he started. He wrote his master's thesis. He expanded that into a doctoral thesis. Okay, and he wrote the book called the uh, called the Liberty Incident. Later, after he published the book on the Liberty, he sued under the Freedom of Information Act the very same NSA because there were there were allusions to the fact that America had had its own set of tapes. Because I had by this time I had released him the the tapes, both the transcripts and the tapes themselves from the Israeli sources, and now he sued the United States, the NSA. For their tapes, and if you go to the uh, NSA website, you can hear in Hebrew the voices of the Israeli pilots, their communications, which dovetail perfectly with the same tapes which which Jay Crystal had used in his book. And he wrote a second iteration of his book uh, about the Liberty, including these new findings from the tape, if you will, which even more vividly uh, paint the picture of this horrible, horrible, tragic attack. And uh, at one point, I remember, and of course, remember there was a Liberty Survivors Organization. Unfortunately, they were egged on by by some people who were not friendly to Israel, such as without going into into okay. okay. Uh, but uh, my heart just goes out to many of uh, of these people. Because, again, they wanted to know the truth, and they were never really told the truth. Did Israel offer reparations? Israel did not just offer reparations. Israel paid reparations. Now, interestingly enough, there are different, and it's, it's actually something which, which became later, this, Israel paid damages. Okay, it didn't pay, uh, when you, you know, if I, if I damage your car on purpose, I'll pay you reparations, but if you pay humanitarian aid of you know of the, the same value, so that is the payment that Israel made in recognition of its responsibility for causing damage and loss of life, but not not accepted because remember America made its share of mistakes as well as will any side in any combat. So the only thing, so the, the takeaway that you get from a very clear reading of Judge Jay Crystal's book, uh, or of course my uh, extensive research into it, uh, and again, I, I helped Jay interview not only all the key people of the time, like Rabin, who was of course the chief of staff at the time of the IDF, you name it, we interviewed him. Not only that, remember I said there were voices on the tapes of the ground controllers, I actually found them one by one, brought them all in a room for, for Jay Crystal, and I had them listen to the tapes and say, okay, whose voice is saying this? Who's saying this? What were you thinking when you said that? Nobody had ever done that. So we actually had a very interesting, uh, well, not a reunion, it was a... Uh, I wouldn't call it an investigation, but an exploration. Very easy, uh, very interesting um, sessions where we recreated not only uh, what was said, but what was in the mindset of people who said something. For example, there were probably there's certain things which which come out which you, if you were wanted to clean up the clean up the story, there's even someone. One of the voices on the tape says, "Maybe it's the Americans." And then you hear someone say, who said Americans? What's and you hear the word Americans. So, so someone, and at some point said, later we said, who is saying that word? And he said, well, maybe he, he said he was thinking maybe he heard there was Americans around the time. And remember, there, there had been evidence of an earlier pilot. By the way, I even found the Nord pilot who made the earlier passes buzzing the ship because the guys on the Liberty in the morning were describing this crazy, you know, pilot flying low over the ship in the morning. I even, from the uh, description of him, I went, found the pilot from another squadron of the Nord pilot, 
went into his logbook. Of course, this wasn't a major incident to him. But then he said, oh, yeah, I remember I was sent that. I was looking for a ship that morning. I remember buzzing the ship because that's what pilots do. You're going to buzz a ship. It's fun. Uh, but all of these little things going, none of it, none of it can ever make up for the fact that innocent life was lost. And people who are doing nothing less than serving their country to the best of their ability, or, and other people who gave their loved ones something most precious to them, and, and that's a tragedy. But if we have something to learn from it, it's to try to learn these lessons and to try to coordinate better. And I know, by the way, Israel, I was actually part of a, uh, the planning of the joint political military group between Israel and the United States to try to de-conflict, if you will, between this. If you look at in the Middle East today, where you have over Syria and Lebanon, you have Israeli air forces, you have Russian airplanes, you know, Americans come in very, it can, things can get out of hand very, very quickly. So the need for coordination uh, is very... Came, came out of this tragedy. Well, it didn't come out. People recognize that this is the sort of thing you have to avoid. And especially today, you have much better capabilities in communications, but you also have much greater lethality. So, again, it's a horrible tragedy. Uh... My heart goes out to anybody who was involved in it. I also felt bad that many of them were never went to their deaths without ever knowing the real story, and without ever having the satisfaction of seeing those who made mistakes pay a real heavy price for it. The book written by Judge Jay Crystal is called uh, "The Liberty Incident." Was I believe it was the, the first uh, book, and then. The second one, I think, was the, the Liberty Incident Revealed or something like that, but that was the second. It's basically an updated version, which included the tapes.